what I'm talking about, it's at one time a year where we can drive our XJs without our eyeballs glued to the temperature gauge. <laughs> well, that's not why I'm calling. Hey, Jeeper, I'm Tony, and welcome to the Jeep Talk Show, where we put the fun in off-road fun. This is the only show where you can hear Jeep owners talk about things like mud rocks and giant tires and not get weird looks. So strap in, grab your favorite beverage, and get ready to laugh, learn, and have a damn good time. We guarantee that after listening to us, you'll have that sudden urge to throw up. No, no I'm sorry. That, that, that's not here. Uh, <laughs> urge to go buy a Jeep and hit the trails. Don't say we didn't warn you. On tonight's episode, uh, in our news stories, we're going to be talk, talking about a Jeep that crashes into Denny's. This is the reason why they need a drive through Larry. I'm just, I'm just saying. Yeah, especially at Denny's. Uh, actually, that might be something they could use in court. They said, well, it said drive through on the sign, <laughs> so I drove through. I drove through. <laughs> so, uh, and what's up, Larry? No, it's not what's up, Larry. What is it? I have to remind it every week. It's fascinating uh, larry or fabricating frenzy that's how uh, nikki g sang it there we go we're gonna do that i like that <laughs> uh please pass the joint oh larry this is this not good uh i mean i, I know the audience is there but it's, this is not good uh, he's gotta wait and also larry talks about his 1970 dodge pickup or as i've named it uh duke 2 and must have for your jeep uh, the and don't give me a negative nelly here rough country uh, front M200 diff skid. This is a Dana 44. I think it's specific to the Rubicon, but don't quote me. Are you ready? It's time for the Jeep Talk Show with hosts Tony, Josh, Wendy, and Chuck. Hi, I'm Larry. And when was the last time you bought a joint? Oh, see, Larry, I know what you're doing here, and God bless you. I mean, I like doing this, too. I mean, this uh, our last uh, flagship episode, I don't know if you saw it or not, where it says uh, pit kills two. And then it has a picture of a, a pit bull on the uh, the image that I made there. You know what I'm doing there, right? Because had you were there. You were, you were, you recorded that episode with me, so you know I what what there. pit what pit we're talking about. It's not a pit bull. <laughs> it's the old bait and switch. It's like, oh my god, a pit killed two, and there's a jeep. It's jeep related. I got to listen to this. And oh, son of a bitch, it has nothing to do with a pit bull. <laughs> Just gotta stick around. That's right. You gotta. You have to listen to find out. You have to listen, or in in, in that case, you have to listen to be upset that it was uh, it was the old bait and switch. You never know. <laughs> So I want to remind you guys about our Patreon. Uh, go over to uh, jeeptalkshow.com slash contact, and you can see where you can join up our Patreon. It's $5 to get started. It means so much to us. It just makes us feel all uh, warm and squishy inside whenever you become a Patreon subscriber. And uh, as you heard in our uh, flagship episode on Tuesday, uh, now it's just really easy to listen and use the Patreon subscription through Spotify. So you can actually use the Spotify app and uh, l- listen to the paid content right there and it just makes it so much nicer and slicker to use also too uh, i hope that you guys uh, are uh, following us on uh, instagram Uh, we uh, put up a lot of stuff there and in fact you get notifications of uh, every episode that goes out and uh, quite often a little clip a little uh, audio clip uh, of uh, the the episode so uh, a little teaser if you will all right, so uh, Jeep crashes into Denny's. And, you know, and, and this happened right here near Studio A. That's where I'm at uh, in Rosenberg, Texas. I'm not in Rosenberg, Texas, but close by. Uh, a Jeep crashed into a Denny's. Uh, there was no waffle harmed in this incident, Larry. No moons, my, moons over my hammies or nothing like that? <laughs> no. So, but I mean, not to make too light of this, because 23 people were injured. And frankly, I'm oh. shocked that there were 23 people in Denny's. <laughs> yeah. Depends what hour of the day you're in. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of Denny's. You know, I would expect something like this to happen at Waffle House. I mean, there's, Waffle just, House, exactly. th- there's just so much uh, damage that you can do to the center block before going through it. You know, uh, that's, that, that's not going to keep a Jeep out. <laughs> at the Waffle House, it was already in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just picking something up. So, uh, so there were several chairs and tables uh, that uh, weren't injured, uh, and, and none of the 23 were injured, at least not seriously. Uh, so, but the tables and chairs were, some of the few of them were going to be goners. Yeah, that little extra bacon wouldn't fix. Yeah, so, yeah, we'll, we'll comp your bacon, one strip of bacon. So, uh, so, so tell me, Larry, this sounds like something that you are not surprised to hear about, but what time of day do you think this would not surprise you? Early, early 
early morning. Like well, the bar is closed at two, right? Yeah. So I'm this would be like two fifteen or something. <laughs> it's at least after midnight, but before six. How's that? There you go. So this didn't happen at two fifteen a.m. in the morning. It was eleven thirty-two a.m. I mean, approaching lunchtime or lunchtime if you're me, because I like getting there for all the yahoos uh, start showing yeah. up at noon. Or dinner, depending on how old you are. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> Or if you're uh, if you're on spring, uh, if you're out for the summer, that's about the time that you get up uh, from staying up till 3 a.m. Uh, watching Netflix and uh, head over to, to Denny's. I mean, I keep saying Denny's. I, I'm just not a Denny's person. I prefer IHOP so much more uh, over Denny's. Yeah, I don't. we don't go much anymore. Is Denny's where you would go? No, Denny's where we used to always hang out, but it got to the point where we would do uh, Bob Evans or something like that. We don't have a Bob Evans. A Bob Evans here is that a, that's a Canadian thing, isn't it? I don't know if it's a Canadian thing. I think do you think you're. I think you're thinking of Tim Horton. Well, I know Tim Hortons is, but I was thinking Bob Evans was also a Canadian thing that you might see more of up north because it's closer to Canada. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's Canadian or not, but you always got that. You always got the Cracker Barrel. Either either one. Yeah. So I don't know why my wife doesn't really care for Cracker Barrel. Did you ever go to a Shoney's? A bre- oh yeah, breakfast buffet. Good uh, Shoney's, Lord. Shoney's Big Boy. They had to shoo me away from the, the vat of bacon. Uh, <laughs> the buffet. Absolutely. You know, the, the bacon and the bacon and the gravy were strategically placed next to each other. <laughs> so that was good. That was good eats. I really enjoyed eating at the, the Shoney's uh, buffet. I would, I would like there to be a Shoney's uh, buffet on the way to uh, Moab. Yeah. Well, until you stop. Yeah, every, every fat kid at heart loves used to love uh, Shoney's. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So anyway, uh, this uh, so police said that the Jeep crashed into the south wall of the building, injuring 23 people inside. Police initially said the victims uh, ranged in age from 12 to 60 years old. So I had actually heard that there was actually an eight-year-old that was uh, was injured in this as well. So the injuries ranged from cuts to broken bones, but no uh, uh, DED dead people, which is very very good. And they That's didn't, big. yeah, they didn't have a, a lot to say about the driver. Uh, all they say is the driver was a thirty-year-old man and did not appear to be driving under the influence, but lost control on a wet road and driving too fast. So, hmm. yeah, and this is like uh, right next to a freeway, uh, 59, so it's always possible. I don't know this to be true. It's always possible that he could have been on the highway, took the uh, the exit, and, uh, you know, it's hard to slow down. Uh, it's, it feels like you're crawling if you've been driving along at 70, 80 miles an hour, and then you get on the feeder road. Uh, and I think that, that whenever it's a yellow sign that says 35, that's just a recommendation by the engineers. There's, there's, you know, you can do, do what you think's best. <laughs> And Which, you know how, how it is. Once you start sliding, it's like you double the speed instantly. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just so weird uh, being out of control like that. I think that's part of the fun of, of going mudding because you're just kind of out of control. You're, just, you're along for the ride. Um, so, uh, yeah. And the, the weird thing was is that, you know, with the, the high pressure that we've had here over Texas and, and I guess much of the central United States uh, recently, that uh, we haven't seen any rain. So... Uh, this accident may may be able to be blamed on the weatherman. Yeah, you, you know, because you know, because they're responsible for the weather. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you haven't had rain for a while, that first little bit of rain, oh, all, that, very all that oil comes up, gets yeah. it nice and slick, hasn't had a chance to wash off yet. <laughs> oh yeah. I like how you work, work that wash in there. That's good. I like that. <laughs> So the police haven't given up, though. They're still investigating the accident. I don't believe any charges were filed. And uh, in the in the photo that you can see in episode 886 of our show notes, jeeptalkshow.com, uh, the, the, the Jeep, uh, I don't believe that's a Grand Cherokee. I think maybe it could be, uh, it, maybe it is a, uh, just a Cherokee, one of the new, the new Cherokees, but I think it's a Grand a Grand Cherokee. But anyway, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, uh, uh, I, I think Josh's XJ looked worse than this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's gonna need some work. It's gonna need some war. Way. It's gonna need some washing at least. <laughs> it's gonna need some washing and a couple washers. <laughs> Definitely some a couple of wash what washers. I had a hard time saying it, Larry. I want to say washers. <laughs> we need to start up a, a, a Zoom meeting where you can teach people to uh, talk like a a mo. <laughs> well, we all have our dialect, right? Oh yeah, I guess so. Uh, mine's normal though. All okay. right, so uh, I would think that perhaps. 
what this guy slid on. You're talking about the oils and stuff to come up off the road. What if somebody had a leak in their diff cover and the, there was some of that on that uh, fluid on the road? That could have caused this accident. Thanks, so you, you might want to look into getting an aftermarket diff cover. We've been talking a lot about diff covers, and I think it's important. I think it's not important until you peel one back. <laughs> Or, or hit it so hard that it's rubbing on the uh, the ring gear uh, that you think to yourself, huh, I should have done something about that before I went off-road. And uh, that's kind of the reasons why we're talking about it is because, uh, I, well, we're, we're talking about it because it worries me, uh, especially with what I went through at uh, EJS last year. Uh, I don't I don't think I hit the diff cover on anything, or maybe I didn't know. There was lots of little things happening, uh, happening off-road. Larry, you said that you had, in a previous episode, you said that you had seen some damage uh, to the, uh, the the U-joint, uh, the interconnect between the U-joint, uh, the yoke, and the uh, drive shaft, right? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure it happened when we were all out at, uh, out at EJS. That was going to be my next question, if it happened out there. Yeah. I you know what trail was. we were on? Not off the top of my head. It, it would either be a Poison Spider or a, uh, it would almost have to be Poison Spider. Because for part of those, I couldn't do real real heavy trails because I was missing a shock. But uh, <laughs> Well, you needed yeah, you, a challenge. <laughs> yeah. But no, you could you clearly see on the yoke on my uh, rear end that it's uh, it's been skipping across a rock. No vibrations or anything negative uh, from, from that interaction then? Not that I'm aware of. Right. Well, you would have been aware of going it, driving it back home at least. Oh, yeah doesn't mean that you won't have future problems for it and uh that uh but a, a diff cover really wouldn't have taken care of that for you would it it would really re- would have required a, a diff cover skid yeah and that's what i run it so there's a skid for the diff cover but thinking about one for the for the drive shaft as well oh that's interesting i didn't think i, I thought that the the skid especially for the rear uh that the, all the diff cover skids were uh that included uh the tr- protecting that uh, that yoke uh, U-joint uh, uh, drive shaft area. Uh, I guess they don't. No, it's it's much lower, and that yoke is a lot farther forward and 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 up. So yeah, it's it's entirely different skid for that. Can you think of a, a reason why you would not uh, want a skid back there, as far as it hanging up on something? Or I guess one of the things you said, I think it was last episode that you uh, last flagship was that you said, what if you bent it and now it was rubbing? Right. Yeah, if you're not supporting it right now, something like a 14 bolt or something like that, where the the pinion section bolts in with its with its own system, you know, that skid is easy to mount, but it's not as easy when you're running you know a standard Dana 44. So I got I got to look into that and see how how it, either I build one or buy one, but. It's something I'm going to look into. Mm-hmm. Well, as I mentioned, the Jeep Talk Show recently spoke about uh, differential aftermarket differential covers uh, for Jeeps. And uh, to help keep the fluid in, uh, the differential, why going uh, off-road? And I guess on-road is always a possibility, too, because there's uh, always some kind of crazy thing that you see. Hopefully, it's not you seeing it directly where you're driving over it. But sometimes you see crazy things on the highway uh, that, uh, given the right circumstance, uh, could uh, could uh, cause you a problem with your diff cover, either front or rear. Um, so, and, and I believe you you mentioned, uh, or actually we had a caller mention uh, on our uh, Tuesday episode where uh, Brad at Trail Recon actually peeled the diff cover uh, on his uh, his van, his off-road van, and uh, right. caused quite a bit of damage because he lost all the fluid. Uh, and there's no there's nothing there to tell you that, you know, the fluid is low or it's empty. So um, if you keep driving it, it's going to be bad for that, uh, that whole uh, uh, pumpkin section and can be quite expensive. So uh, but doing something like this before you run out of fluid is a, is a good thing, I think. Yeah, unless you got someone directly behind you. You know, there's no check engine light or low low diff fluid light or mm-hmm. and it probably no isn't even a smell I, I i doubt that it would get hot enough for you for it to smoke and start getting an odor no if someone if someone isn't directly behind you to, to watch to watch it all happen and see the trail i i don't think you'd even know until it locked up mm-hmm. yeah that would just not be good it's like what the hell what the hell's going on and uh, go back there and go son of a bitch i wish i knew this had been leaking um, right doesn't mean you can't put a sensor on there, but it would definitely have to be aftermarket. And right off the top of my head, I, I don't know uh, who you would uh, who you go to, to do that. You probably have to build something all by yourself. Yeah, it's simpler. It's a it's a lot simpler just to put a heavy duty uh, diff cover on there that uh, that can't get peeled back. I think. Right. 
I think so too. So, um, one of the things I asked about on the roundtable episode having to do with diff covers is a, a, a video that I saw a while back that I, f- I found out afterwards was a Gail Banks video where they used a plexiglass cover to show the the, the flow of the uh, diff fluid. And um, one of the things that uh, he mentioned that video was is that uh, if you don't have a, the right shaped internal, uh, the internal shape of the diff cover, then you may be splashing fluid around and not getting it to where it needs to go. Uh, I mean, the the ring gear can actually pull the fluid up and over. Uh, if it's uh, hitting the stuff, um, the diff cover properly, you have this uh, fluid dynamics flow where it goes to the, the bearing in the front and the, the pinion uh, so that it keeps that oil uh, oiled and lubricated and a little cooler as well because you know that oil is going to be taking away some of the heat. Right. So, so uh, but that didn't seem to be a concern for the, the people on the round table. I've watched more videos from Gail Banks, and I'm a little concerned about it. I mean, I don't think that initially is going to be a, a diff, uh, internal uh, diff uh, mechanism killer. But I, I look at it like, well, it can't hurt to actually have it flow properly. Um, and you never know uh, what failure it may keep for, from happening. So I'm looking more at uh, the diff covers that um, kind of shape to the ring gear so that you would think that as the ring gear picks up the, the, the diff fluid and uh, it flows, it's going to flow over the top of the ring gear into the back of the, uh, of the pumpkin. Yeah, and I think it makes a big difference, too, if we're talking about a, a dedicated trail rig rock crawler. Oh, yeah. That, that you never get to speed versus something like most of us do. We're going to drive it for... 20 hours at a trail and then jump on. So, you know, when, when you're on that road doing 80 miles an hour, this just becomes a, a real thing. If you're not getting good flow of oil over that, over that ring and that bearing, it's going to lock up on you. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a great point uh, is that it really depends on how you're using the, the rig. If it's dedicated rail rig, you're not going to be going very fast. Uh, if you are going fast, you're not going to be doing it for very long. Uh, so the, the, I mean, I think it's still a good idea to have everything oiled properly, but it's, sure. it's not going to get as hot. It's not, it, there's a lot of things that aren't going to happen. Uh, I think, uh, that would certainly happen if you're doing 80, 90 miles an hour, uh, on the, the highway, uh, going to or from, and, and that's probably where it's going to fail anyway. Right. So, um, so it was really interesting because, uh, the banks folks did a lot of research into this. And uh, they found out what I think you'd expect. Fluid dynamics, aerodynamics all played a part in how well the diff cover performed in heat and fuel economy. I was really surprised about the fuel economy. They actually were able to measure the fuel economy savings. Obviously, they didn't do it for the the 100,000 miles that they estimated. uh, But uh, they they came up with a savings, at least for the the Dodge uh, Dually that they were testing on, a savings about uh, $475 over 100,000 miles, which, of course, is going to be pennies uh, per mile. Uh, right. but, but, you know, saving, saving anything is a great idea. And more importantly, if it's saving uh, fuel, it's probably running more efficiently. And, and, and I think the efficiency of our vehicles is very important. The more efficient it is, uh, the faster you can go, the cooler it's going to be, and the longer it's going to last. Yeah, and I think if you watch other videos of Gail Banks, that's just cr- that's just on par with a lot of stuff that they do. It's all based more on science than it is just, hey, this is pretty cool. <laughs> this looks good. <laughs> let's let's. Uh, my dad's got a, a barn. Let's put on a show. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I think one of the cool things was uh, that uh, uh, Gail Banks was talking about uh, the the very popular uh, diff cover that is just flat. Uh, the back of it is just flat, and it's got fins on it, you know, for cooling. And uh, there's two things, there's two problems that I saw with that. Uh, air doesn't flow very well over something that's flat unless it's in the airflow. And this was right. this is out of the airflow. <laughs> and the other thing was is that it was flat. And where's the, you know, where's the fluid going to go? It's going to splash on the, on, you know, it's like hitting a wall. And uh, so the funny thing was is that he had several diff covers laid out there on the table. And they were all flat, like the first one that came out. 
So it was like there was no research done. There was just they just copied it. <laughs> right. This was cool. Let's, yeah. Let's just make some money. Uh, who cares how it works or if it doesn't work as long as we don't get sued over it. So that's one of the things I really respected from uh, from the banks uh, folks is that they did a lot of research. They did their homework and uh, actually uh, set up a, a, a diff cover for uh, fluid and aerodynamics. Yeah, that's a good video. Yeah. Sad thing is. They don't make a diff cover for the Jeep. Uh, and I think you pointed out, uh, pointed this out, uh, Larry, that uh, if they did, it probably would be uh, some uh, forged material, uh, like uh, not necessarily something that would be, that would be perfect for off-roading. Right. Uh, that's not, for what I've seen of the, the Banks makes, it's more for the diesel and truck gear. It's, yeah. not, it's not as much for off-roading, but... You know, if 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 they do make anything for the Jeep, it's probably more towards the the diesel Gladiator. Maybe there's something that they make for that. No, I, I check. They have nothing in the the differential really? okay. covers for uh, any Jeeps. Uh, they do sell things for Jeeps, but it has more to do with, I believe, performance. Um, okay. uh, but uh, nothing uh, for diff covers. I mean, there may be maybe I, I looked at the website, so uh, maybe you guys uh, know something that uh, that they make uh, diff cover wise for for Jeeps that I didn't find. But when I ser- I researched it, I didn't see it. So with this in mind, uh, with the the idea of uh, the the fluid dynamics, the fu- the the diff uh, fluid flow, I'm looking more at the ARB uh, diff cover. We have it here in our show notes, Larry. If you don't remember the, how the ARB is set up, but I always thought it was kind of strange how uh, ARB had that that notch right there where the ring gear uh, goes. And and now I'm understanding a little better about why it may be there. Right. Yeah. They get the oil around it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't put it here. I think this is a ballistic uh, fab uh, diff cover that I also have in the show notes that is uh, set up similar. It has a little area there for the uh, for the ring gear, uh, and I think that probably would work well uh, for uh, getting the fluid up and over. And, you know, I may be making a, a much bigger deal out of this than what it really is uh, that there's really an issue. I mean, some of the uh, – I mean, I really like the Motobilt one. I really like uh, the uh, rough uh, the, the rough stuff diff covers. I've got two of those on my uh, XJ. and uh, the, But they don't, they're not made like this, and I don't know how, how critically important this is. Uh, but I don't want to find out. Uh, yes, I'm out. <laughs> you want to find out the hard way. <laughs> I don't want to find out when I'm off-road someplace or, or worse, heading home and I'm uh, 1,500 miles from home. Yeah, you don't want to all of a sudden figure out, oh, I was wrong. <laughs> well, I should have done something about this. So I'm kind of leaning towards uh, maybe just doing a, a front and rear uh, diff skid and leaving the factory uh, diff cover in place because you would think that the the factory people, the, the fine people at Jeep, uh, have gone through all this stuff, and uh, it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to last, you know, for the 100,000, 200,000 miles, whatever uh, you'd expect the axle to last. Yeah, you would think. Yeah, they got to <laughs> protect that warranty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know which way I'm going to go yet. Uh, the, and, Larry, what do you think for yourself? Are you going to do uh, suspenders and a belt or uh, just the suspenders? I'm thinking just suspenders. I've got that. I've got the skid on mine, and it's worked very well. Now, I can see if I were to roll off a rock and maybe back up into it, it, it rolled up really high over my skid, I could have an issue. But I've beat that skid on so many things, you know, trying to wheel, record videos, deal with Duke while I'm in there, and <laughs> doing everything but actually driving. What's What's Duke's McDonald's favorite? What is it that? Oh, bacon, egg, and cheese all bacon, the way. Bacon, egg, cheese, yeah. Duke, I'm sw- I swear to God, you're just smelling what you ate. There's no more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I know, I know you're supposed to put wheels on it, go up and over, but sometimes, well, you're preoccupied and doing things you, you really shouldn't be doing. Uh, yeah, exactly. Or you forgot because, you know, a few seconds ago you were looking down at something and you forgot what was in, what was coming up in front of you. I know you're not supposed to do that, but... Uh, <laughs> I need a, a, a virtual reality headset or augmented reality headset so I can see what's in front of me, even whenever the engine, the hood, and everything else is in the way. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it makes it exciting. Like, oh, I don't remember that being there. <laughs> like, I guess there was a drop. <laughs> that, that, bam. <laughs> Should have gone slower on that. My bad. Ooh-wee. Welcome to Fabricating Frenzy. With Larry, also known as Jeeping Mo, whose hair is not curly. All right, so what's your favorite type of joint? 
And no, we're not talking about going to Burning Man. We're talking about suspension upgrades. <laughs> Nobody had a four wheel drive. I'm sorry, one person had a four wheel drive at Burning Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All stuck in the mud. Damn hippies. <laughs> and so one of the common upgrades are new control arms. And how do you pick what control arm you that you pick? And there are several brands and styles out there. So whether you have Heim joints, Johnny joints, or urethane style joints, there are several names on these joints and how they're assembled are all a little bit different. And the performance and life of all of them will change just a little bit. So you're looking at a joint, are you looking for a durability? Are you looking for comfort, ease of install? Most of these can be bought as a system or a builder kit. So what are some of the different types and why would you want them? So we'll start with rubber bushings. And these are what's in most of your factory control arms. Now they're a good combination of flex and comfort and they are typically not rebuildable. They offer a moderate amount of flex and dampening for the trail and the road for a reasonable cost. And they are typically, you know, the least expensive arm or joint out there. So if you damage an arm, they're usually, you know, not that expensive to replace. And they're typically bought in some fixed length. And then we got a Duraflex style joint. Now these are enhancements to the rubber style bushing, but they offer more flexibility and the ability to replace rubber bushing and it's easily serviceable. They offer a good dampener to the trail and road vibrations and don't transfer sound very well. Now you can typically get these in different stiffnesses for your application. And there's a little bit more cost involved. There are several manufacturers for these and the one we're mentioning by namesake is Metal Cloak. Now, I've actually built a set of these out of those, these bushings, and they're very nice. And then you have the Heim joint. Now, this is a steel joint with a swivel in the mount. It will typically translates movement and articulation very well. And it will give you pretty much the most articulation out of any, any of the joints and the most strength. But there is no dampening for the road or trail comfort and noise. Well, that's just that's just jeeping, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh yeah, and you can always tell when someone's got heim joints in there and they've been in there a while. Now most of these are serviceable, and it's a good choice if you have a very rough or very high horsepower applications, and they're moderately priced. But you will feel every bump and hear a lot of squeaking if you don't service them. And you'll always hear that joint out the Jeep out there who's had old Heim joints because they are squeaking and rattling. Everybody's running around spraying them with WD-40 or something. How, how long do these things hold up? I know it, it really depends on how they're used off-road, how often they're used off-road. At least I assume that's the case. But yeah. is, is this something that – because people, they go, oh, well, this is a no-brainer. I should just go with this. I don't care about how, how smooth the ride is. I want something that articulates well and uh, works well. If it makes a, a few noises, I don't care. Uh, but do they not last as long as, like, say, rubber bushings? I mean, are you going to be rebuilding these things more often? No, a heim joint will last a long time. As long as you're taking them – and it's – I'll just say this. The heim joint is just like any of the other joints – if you're servicing them, they last a very long time. Good. You're taking, you're cleaning them and stuff like that. And you like the Duraflex joint, which is like an enhanced rubber bushing. According to Metal Cloak, you don't have to service them at all, right? So I've actually taken them out apart and cleaned them and just just seen. And you know, for those, they said they didn't need any service, and they're they're not lying. It really didn't show much. But for like the Heim joints and that, you really need to take those apart, clean them out, and re-lube them. So then we also have the Johnny joint style joint. So those are very similar to the traditional Heim joint, but they offer an improved comfort and dampening from road and trail. There is a molded rubber pieces that hold the center section and allow it to rotate rubber or urethane style mount. Ah, okay. Right? You've seen one of these, mm -hmm. if you remember. It gives a lot of flexibility, just like the Heim joint. But these are on the upper end of expense, but are good and a good all-around joint. So if you remember right, when we were rebuilding that one of Riches on the trail out mm -hmm. at uh, Hell's Revenge, mm -hmm. 
Now, that wasn't a uh, Johnny joint. I think that was made by... Uh, yeah, I thought it was a I thought it was a Johnny Joint, and then I, re- I remember Rich, right. Rich I called it by name. He says it's just like a Johnny Joint, but it was made by someone. Was right. it Barnes yeah. or something? I think that, he got I think he got it from Barnes. Yeah, right? there we go. But it's a sim it's a similar style of joint where you have the center the center uh, ball, if you will, that everything mounts to, but it's got two rubber pieces on each side, and that's what holds that in place. And it, it offers you a lot of vibration dampening. I don't want to say just comfort, but you know it, it doesn't. It does take up a lot of that shock and vibration. So this it's is not, what you'd find on a Cadillac, is what you're saying? Yeah, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> it's just you know that smoothness. I mean, I understand, especially if you're driving a long ways. That smoothing, that smoothness and noise uh, is is very important. But uh, off road, uh, who cares? But yeah, no. I mean, if, if you can have the best of both worlds, this sounds like it's. Very similar to the rubber uh, bushing, uh, but also get the strength of the uh, of the the heim joint. Of the heim joint, exactly. And you know, everybody likes to say that you know they don't care about any of that until you got that guy behind you that's got that that <laughs> annoying squeak or rattle. And I've been that guy on the trail to ask team member Bill, who's got a rattle around every now and then. So you know, if if you got stuff that rattles and squeaks, trust me, everybody quickly tunes in on it. And once you've tuned in on it, you're focused, right? <laughs> so all these joints can be bought is either a system or a builder kit where you can weld the bushings in a housing and install them with you know just whatever you whatever you want so justifying what you want to do with your new joints and the requirements and for the maintenance it's just something you just have to do when you're trying to spec it out just know what you want to do and how you want to maintain it and then spec out the joint from there now i bent the lowered control arm and this was, uh, I think, the first, I think it was the first Texas Jeep event. I had actually bent my factory jail lower control arm. And it actually shortened that arm about three-eighths of an inch. That wow. it, was bent that, it was bent that bad. So I built a new set of lowers out of that Duraflex joint from Metal Cloak. So I bought a piece of you know, quarter-wall tubing and mounted those joints in that. So that way it's not going to bend again. Did you make them adjustable, or is it a fixed length? So it's fixed on the one end and adjustable on the other. So where the the Heim joint or the Duraflex joint, you can screw it in and and, and, uh, and unscrew it. But that's part of the welding part of it, is you didn't have to actually thread the the pipe. Right, right. Yeah, I welded the, uh, the actual body on one end, and I welded a bung on the other so that you know, I could drop it, adjust it, and put it right back in. Right now, you can now you can't always weld a right and a left hand bung in the each side of the tubing, and that way you just rotate the bar and it'll adjust it out or in. Right, that's always a way to do that. But you know, once you've figured out what you want to do with the with the control arm, you know, if you want to build specifically just for performance and you're going to beat on it, or if you want a little bit of road comfort, or you're okay with the kind of a stock rig. Once you spec out what style joints you want, it's it's kind of an easy direction. There's a ton of them out there, and you know even the worst ones anymore are not that bad if you once you've figured out what style you're going to use. Mm-hmm. So you went with the Duraflex on your on your rig, right? Right. Is that what you would go with again, or would you consider one of these other ones? Well, I like that Duraflex. Eventually, I'm going to build all the rest of them, and I think I'll keep them out of the same the same uh, joint. But that's not to say that, like, the Johnny joint, if I were going to do a, a different joint, it would probably be, like, the Johnny joint or that Barnes version of a Johnny joint because I like that that ball being encapsulated in, you know, some kind of rubber because it, it, it would be a much better ride on the road because, you know, we all drive our rig to the to the event and got to drive it back, and that's a lot of road for uh solid steel joint mm-hmm. so uh the other question as far as it, it it seems to me that getting the like the johnny joint or the duraflex uh that you, where you weld it into the tube it seems to me to be something that's very easy if you know how to weld uh because it's just this this piece that you stick in the tube and then you weld that part that it screws into um but uh, my concern would be and this is only because i've never welded uh how do you know that you've got that weld, that bung welded in there, 
sufficiently where it's not going to separate. <laughs> Hopefully not at well, 80 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's two ways you weld that in. One, you cross-drill the actual piece of tubing it's going into, and you plug weld it on both sides. Ah, nice. Right, so that so that's one way you lock it in. Uh, can't you and do you, both? <laughs> and and then you then you run a you run a bead around the the face of the tube where it meets the bung. Mm -hmm. So you're actually you've got two different styles of welds on there. Now there's a lot of times because of the plug weld, you have to run a tap through the bung because the weld causes it to shrink just a little bit in that area. So when you weld like that, they're very stout. Now, if you elect to actually weld the housing on the end where you have to cope the end of the tubing to, to match the housing, right? typically you'll want to throw like a piece of brass in there of that size so when you're welding, you're not collapsing that housing or causing it to pull funny, and it helps it cool in that area. Interesting. But, yeah, but, you know, I'll just say for anybody with even, even a 110 flux core welder, if you're just wanting to weld in the bung, it, the, if you're going to plug weld it, it doesn't take much to drill that cross hole, fill it back up with weld, and it run a path around the outside, run a tap back through it. Just make sure that you don't put two rights or two lefts, right? If you're going to do that, you put a, a left in one side and a right hand on the other so that when you rotate it, it expands or, you know, collapses. Right. And just make sure you lock it down afterwards. <laughs> Locking it down is important. <laughs> it, it's kind of important. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's really cool. And uh, as far as uh, a price goes, because I know uh, control arms can be pretty pricey. Um, right. For for you, if you recall, how, about how much did you spend on uh, on your lower control arms for your for your JL? Yeah, I think the joints are. I think I've got a couple. I'm going to say. I think the joint was around one hundred fifty dollars. Oh wow! I had no idea it was that expensive. Yeah. Then you got the, then you got the tubing. You know, so I'm not going to say you save a whole lot by building them yourself. Then it, then you would just uh, buying them off the shelf. It's more that I like building things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, having the yeah. knowledge and uh, the experience, and also gaining right. the experience. I also, too, you you did it yourself, and you know what to expect from it. So right. uh, I know a lot of the lower control arms uh, have a, a bend in them. Uh, yours do not, I would assume. No, so the rears don't, right? The rears on the, the JL, I think even a JT, the rears are straight. Now the fronts, those do have a bend. And when I end up building those, I'll put a bend in that tube as well. And would you just use a, a tube bender to do that? Right, I'll just use a tube bender and I'll just take off the factory, kind of make it a, a template off the factory know how much I have to bend it mm -hmm. and then just bend a fit on that. And I'm thinking that uh, making uh, doing a, a left thread and a, a right thread on the, the ends is not going to be uh, the, the way to go with a bent uh, tube. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, that's, no a, that. that's another thing. Do you bend it up or you bend it down? I, I, I've seen them both ways. Well, on that, they're bent left or right, and you just have to You'll put your oh okay. I, I was thinking, uh, but to keeping it keeping it up high. But yeah, that you you bend it because of the tires, right? Right. right. Well, you bend it because of the the joints out farther than the uh, than the mounts. But you know what I've what I've been seeing lately is people are making the new uh, the, the new control arms for the JLs, and they're they're just not, they're just totally ignoring that. They're just making them straight. Yeah. Well, I mean, being adjustable, that would be a lot easier for adjustment. And if they're if they're stout enough, it really doesn't matter, does it? Right. I mean, they're right. still higher than the diff. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And you could and you could still weld one of the housings at a slight angle, and to put all the adjustment on the other end, and you and it, and it would serve the same purpose. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I'm glad you covered that. That's uh, something I was wondering about. I mean, I, I know what a Johnny Johnny joint is. I knew whenever we were, uh, uh, whenever you were working on uh, Rich's uh, uh, issue with his, and his, his wasn't a major issue. It was just a problem getting the clip to, uh, to stay in. There just wasn't quite enough room uh, for that uh, clip to be in there. What was that problem? The, the the that rubber piece was too thick or something? Well, what happened is that. When you press it in, it takes this little thin washer over the, over the face of that rubber piece, and that and that had bent. Ah, right. 
So then we're trying to force it in, and we're fighting that. And it was later he told us that that washer had bent, and that's the reason why we couldn't push it all together. So once he – and we ended up grinding that a little bit just as a trail fix. Mm-hmm. So once he got the new piece and, and the right washer, he said it just pressed together real easy. Like it was supposed to, right. Right. The trail vise, the, uh, the, the Jeeping Mo trail vise was used uh, a lot on that and cranked the hell down on the several occasions <laughs> trying to pop that clip in. <laughs> oh, yeah. But if you want to see the trail vise or if you want to see a set of those uh, control arms built with the Duraflex, it's all on Jeeping Mo and we walk you through how to build them. And uh, you, when you say it's on Jeeping Mo, you mean the website or the YouTube channel, or yes? Uh, well, yes, you can go to Jeeping Mo on YouTube, or you can go to JeepingMo.com, and it's there as well. From the mind of Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G. Now that Labor Day is behind us, it's that time of year that us XJ lovers look forward to all summer. No, I'm not talking about football season or the upcoming holidays. What I'm talking about, it's that one time of year where we can drive our XJs without our eyeballs glued to the temperature gauge. <laughs> well, that's not why I'm calling. I'm calling to tell you that my vacuum cleaner don't work anymore. Yeah, it really blows. <laughs> All right, boys and girls, I'll chat to you later and have a good one. Bye. Nope, I'm sorry. The BMW joke was better. It much better. Yeah. Much better, yeah. So, Larry, uh, tell us about Duke yeah so i picked up an, an older dodge pickup just uh i'm tired of hauling everything in my truck and towing everything but everything's <laughs> back there i'm pretty sure jimmy hoff is back there too <laughs> yeah everything's in my jeep right I'm, try, I'm tired of using it like a truck so i bought a i bought a builder slash old truck it's a uh, 1970 dodge d100 right and it's uh well it's gonna take a little work to get on the road but it's it's a D100, but all the running gear, everything under it is a three-quarter ton. It's got a nice work box on it. But what's funny is a I'm nice going, work box. That thing looks like it's not from the 70s. It, it's really nice. No, and I think whoever modified this uh, modified the whole running gear because, you know, I keep looking at the VIN and everything, and it's a four-wheel drive. It's a 383 engine in it. Because I, I have a tow rig build coming up soon, and uh, and I need something to haul everything in. But as I'm going through this thing, trying to get some of the stuff, I'll call it functioning, I'm finding that a lot of things that you know we, we as Jeepers modify our Jeeps to, I'm kind of seeing where some of the origins were for some of that, right? So one of the things that I, I blew a power steering hose off of it, and... Uh, I'm underneath this thing looking at the steering system, and it, it looks totally foreign. It's not your typical um, Pitman arm running down to a, you know, to a to a tie rod or any of that. It's it's for one, it's a closed knuckle system, and you have to look that up. And uh, Josh Downs from the uh, from the Discord room helped me with that a little bit because I personally have never dealt with a closed knuckle. It's it looks nothing like a traditional, you know, front end knuckle. So it's a Dana 60 in the rear, a Dana 44 in the front, but it's got lockout hubs. But the steering on it, the pitman arm pushes on a control valve that pushes on a knuckle that also feeds a hydraulic cylinder to attach to the tie rod. Right? So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking it was something someone added. Because it kind of looks just like a modern day PSC steering system you put on your Jeep. So you know how everybody is putting a hydraulic uh, hydraulic assist on their Jeeps. It's very similar to that, except for this is the 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 early versions of that, if you will. But it's a you know it's a cool old Jeep that needs some it needs a little bit of work. Not a Jeep. Not a Jeep, Larry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so used to saying people, Jeep. I know. People are going, really? It's a Jeep? <laughs> it's a Jeep truck? No, nope. It's not a Jeep truck. I got in a groove there. It's a pretty cool old truck that's going to tow a Jeep eventually until I get the tow well, rig Well, I was wondering built. about that. When you, when you said tow rig, I thought this was the tow rig. So it'll do some towing until I get the main rig built because uh, the, the, the main tow rig 
it it's going to be a little bit before it gets to the gets to the house and it's got a it's going to need a major overhaul new axles engine and everything else so this truck is going to serve a little bit of towing and you know a lot of parts running as well what kind of uh, do you know what kind of gears you have in the diff the diffs i don't know yet I haven't done uh, the, the tire rotation yet no, not yet. I still have to uh, get through all that because they were taking it off the trailer because I had it trailered in because I try to drive it. I drove it on the backcountry roads where I looked at it at, and at 40, it was quite terrifying. So, suggestive steering, I think, is one of the terms we came up with on, uh, that on the Discord server. Yeah, there was about 90 degrees of uh, slop in that steering wheel. And I'm okay with a little bit because old vehicles, well, they kind of wandered, right? Well, not that we approve it here, but it's great for DUI driving. So yeah. <laughs> don't make any yeah. any quick quick motions while you're drunk. <laughs> yeah, so they were taken off the trailer and it, it blew that hose off. So what's interesting is on that system, when the steering box goes forward, it pushes on what they call a power steering control valve. And it's attached to the knuckle. And out of that comes all of these power steering lines, right? So there's one for the left, one for the right. God, this doesn't sound legal. <laughs> Not for no. the road. <laughs> no. Because, like I said, I'm thinking this looks like some kind of backcountry hodgepodge. And it's 100% factory. When it pushes on that rod, it moves just enough to cycle that valve to tell the cylinder to move right or left. So it's a... Uh, but does this work if a hose pops, or do you lose left searing? Like, you can only do right turn, Clyde. No, what you told me, you lose all the power assist. Oh, okay, good. Right? It'll still move. You'll have about, I'm thinking about a quarter inch of slop in the steering from the valve shifting back and forth and nothing happening. Right. So, so you won't lose all of your steering. You lose all the power part of it. Right. And, and then it pukes out all the fluid. You just, you just a, lose all the feeling in your, your chest muscles after a while. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. So, it's a four-speed with the four-wheel drive. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, Duke's going to be right. He's going to get to ride up front because there is only an up front. That's right. And then someone had taken out the uh, gas tank that they put behind, used to oh, put behind yeah. the seats. Yeah, that's right. W- which I always hated, right? I always hate knowing if there's an accident and I'm swimming with the fuel. <laughs> and there's a 40-gallon tank sitting under the rear. And so it, it's like a big rectangle square-looking thing, too. It's not like, like shaped or anything. It's just like like what you'd expect a uh, an auxiliary tank to look like. I mean, from absolutely. the 70s. Yeah. yeah. 40 gallons. My God. <laughs> yeah, and that big old 383 that's in there. It was, that's what's funny is... I looked up the specs for that 383, and it's like 240 horse. And, you That's know, nice. Yeah, around 400 foot-pounds of torque. But, you know, if you look at the modern-day engines of 383, that thing would be 400, 400 plus horse by, you know, today's standard. Right, but, I mean, it, not bad for a tow rig, especially with that torque. Right, right. And it's a fairly heavy vehicle, right? It's heavier with that big, uh, uh, what do you call that box on the back? Yeah, it's a big work box. So work if you box. think, of, Yeah, if you think about how... Uh, Someone's showing up a contractor, you know, the box on the back that has all the doors on the sides. And there's a, a big section in the middle that'll uh, slide open and close. The truck came with an extra hood and an extra set of fenders, and the hood is sitting in that section. So you could put, you know, plywood or anything in there. And, you know, I was looking at that, just thinking that, you know, if we go somewhere, I could very easily put an air mattress in the back of this thing, slide it closed, and we're overlanding. And then you're you're kicking the thing and somebody let me out. <laughs> let me out. Let me out. Duke, Duke locked me in there until he gets another treat. That's right. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I did not know this. I thought this was the, the tow rig. I thought that, that you just went with this because an opportunity presented itself. And I didn't realize that this, this wasn't going to tow the rig. So this is really going to be the, the run around, uh, buy parts, uh, uh, type, uh, type rig for your, instead of do, you doing all the truck stuff with your Jeep, you're going to do truck stuff with a truck. Right. And like I said, it's going to do a little towing because the, the primary tow rig, that's going to be a long-term build, right? It's going to take me a little while, little, a little ways because the truck that we, that we're going to bring in for that, it's going to need axles and engine and it's going to need a lot of work. Right. And you know, it's probably going to take me a year to get that thing together once I get it. 
where this one, I can get it on a road and I can do a little bit with it. I can do a little bit of towing until the other one gets ready. So uh, are you going to do anything uh, like maybe uh, put uh, fuel injection on that uh, 383, get a little more, uh, I don't know, uh, stability out of it instead of having to mess around with uh, jets and carburetor and adjustment? I would assume it has like a two barrel on it or something. It's got a two barrel. So that's something I've been looking at. So I've been looking at either, either that Holley Sniper system, which, you know, really is a throttle body system. And Ad- Edelbrock makes a really nice fuel injection for that, right? It's a, it's a big block uh, Mopar is what it's considered. And they make a really nice fuel injection system for that thing. And uh, so I'd replace the distributor and I'd replace the intake manifold. And they would put the injectors and everything in it. And, you know, it's, there's not a lot of difference in price between that sniper and that and that other system. So, Well, don't go with the sniper because if you make that work right out of the box, you're, you're going to offend Chuck. Cause, yeah. Because <laughs> he couldn't make his work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really like that that Edelbrock system on there. But you know, I, I love Edelbrock stuff. Yeah, that's something I've got to do. You know, one of the first things once I get everything else done is, get, I'm going to put a new timing chain in it because I figured you know, it's it's got over it's around a hundred thousand miles on it, so it's easy to just replace a chain in it before the, before it goes. And on that uh, and on that engine of that era, time and chain is an easy thing to do. Right. And, and did it run okay when you were when you were running it? Did it sound good? Yeah. No, it started it started right up, runs fine. And uh, were you going to do a compression test on it well, before you start taking it, uh, uh, any uh, vast distances, just to make sure that all the pistons are pissing properly? Yeah, I'll check all that. And you know, before I would buy anything like a uh, you know a fuel injection for it, we'll oh, go yeah. th- we'll go through it and check all that stuff to figure out if I got to rebuild the engine or not. But yeah, we'll check it. But it, you know, it seems to be firing in all all of them. It doesn't. It doesn't appear on the surface to be missing. So you know, once I get the steering going and get the plates on it, so I can get it out and, and, and do a few things with it. You know how it is. Once you get it on the road and drive a little bit, things are popping up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, this is going to be a great thing to hear about, and uh, it is Jeepy because it's a, a tow rig, so nobody nobody complain about it. Of course, I don't think anybody's complaining about this. It's just fun hearing about uh, older vehicles and uh, being able to use them. It is a Dodge. So. It's in the family. Mm-hmm. All right, so in uh, this week's uh, must-have, or at least this uh, flagship episode's must-have stuff pick of the week uh, for your Jeep, I guess this would be the second uh, pick of the week. Um, the Rough Country uh, Front M210 diff skid plate for the uh, night, uh, summer 2018 to 2022 Jeep Wrangler JL. Uh, and it also is good for the 2020 through 2022 uh, f- uh, four wheel drive because, you know, they make a two wheel drive. Jeep Gladiator this is so funny. Uh, it, it, people just don't know what the hell they're talking about when they do ads. Uh, but the, the thing I really love about this, uh, not that it's rough country, because rough country has a bit of a stigma attached to it, uh, but it is $99.95. And Nothing this, yeah, and this protects uh, not only the, uh, and don't quote me on this, but I think it goes all the way back far enough for the uh, for the, the, the yoke. It actually uh, gives you some protection in the yoke area as well. I'm going to have a close look at this because uh, I really like this. Now, the, the one thing I can say that is a detractor is uh, in the ad, it says Rubicon only. And uh, I know the axles are different on the Rubicon for the JL and the JT um, unless you have the max tow package. And if you have the max tow package, then you get the same axles as the Rubicon minus the lockers. But that's my understanding. And I believe the, the M210 is what, what, uh, what tells you uh, what it'll fit. Because uh, I don't think that it's an M210 uh, uh, on the, the front of a, uh, a Gladiator uh, that doesn't have the, the max tow. But I need, to, I need to research that before I start buying anything. But I really like the idea of this thing. I need to see how it attaches. I need to see if it uh, attaches, uh, if you could put an aftermarket uh, diff cover on and it still attaches properly. Uh, several things, but I, I believe it will, but it, it may, like I said, I have to do some more research on it. So one reviewer uh, said, and I thought this was good, uh, it's half the price, but not half the quality. Now, he didn't say it was uh, twice the quality. This is not half. <laughs> right. But he says, great product for the money. And uh, I already mentioned the Rubicon only, uh, but this, uh, this may uh, also work on a Gladiator with a max toe, but you need to do your research before you buy it. Yeah. 
You know, it's always a little sad when we hit the end of the trail, but there's always another trail ride just down the road. I remember that long drive back from uh, from Moab, Larry. It was it was nice getting to go home, but it was a little sad not seeing uh, Moab, Moab and seeing you guys and uh, seeing who uh, who Duke was going to think about fighting next. Because he's got that look in his eyes. I never was worried about it, but he's got that look in his eyes. <laughs> it's, always twi- it's always twice to drive, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, Jeep Talk Show has four episodes a week, Tuesday through Friday, and every other week we have five episodes with the JTS Chick Chat with uh, Julianne and uh, Wendy. Uh, great, great episode. Getting a lot of good comments on that one. you gotta, you got to hear that one, and it might be the way you hook your significant other into this whole jeeping thing but hey listen to chick chat it's uh it's women talking to other women about uh jeep stuff so might this be enough to, to get them uh, uh addicted so all you need to do is subscribe and never miss an episode speaking of subscribing consider keeping the jeep talk show on the air by subscribing to the show via patreon uh the place to go for all information on how to subscribe and how to contact us is jeeptalkshow.com slash contact Broadcasting since 2010. Damn it, Larry. 57 minutes and 20 seconds. Not (laughs) bad.